This is a, a functional definition of pornography. And that is anything that induces an inappropriate sexual interest for that person. We need to teach our children this. It's not naked pictures or movies with people having sex. That is pornography, but it's not just that. Anything that induces an inappropriate sexual interest for that person. Movies, magazines, websites, television, video games can and do contain pornography. Research indicates that by their senior year in high school, males, 100% of them, will have viewed pornography. 100%. Average age of exposure. Any guesses? 8. 8, 12. 6. It's 11. So, that means there are children that are exposed earlier than this. This is the average. 11 years old. I have an 11 year old. We have had this talk with him, and I was so reluctant to do it. I did not want to rob him of his innocence by telling him about things that he had no knowledge of. But if we don't, Satan will. If we won't teach our children, the adversary will. And he will fill them with darkness. President Hinckley says, I am convinced that this is a serious problem even amongst us. These are not them. These are not people of the world. These are not sexual deviants or faceless perverts. These are our loved ones. These are our family. Dr. Hilton, who wrote this book, which I took a lot of information from, he restores my soul. This is a book about pornography and about pornography addiction. He is a, a brain surgeon. We'll talk more about what he teaches. But he says, pornography is so compelling that all who are not vigilant are at risk. This is something that we have to take seriously and we have to talk to our children about. At a younger and younger age, they are being exposed to pornography. Anything that elicits a sexual interest in that person. This is from Ralph Yarrow, and I like this quote. He's a former Nobel executive. If you, for those of you who don't know, Nobel does security for computers. He now devotes his life to talking about and fighting pornography. And he says, wake up. Apathy will kill you here. If porn hasn't touched your life already, it's going to rip huge gaping holes in it. You better get active real quick. We're going to talk about how we're going to get active. This is from Bruce Hafner. He says, virtually every family has been or will be affected in some way. Let us remember that men and women, boys and girls, who struggle with addiction are not those people. They are our sons and daughters, our sweet companions, our husband, your husbands, your wives, your grandchildren, and their spouses. This is from Bruce, sorry, Hathen. He says, I am a lost sheep, you are a lost sheep, we are all alike gone astray. Like I talked about, Satan is going to use anything we give him. I think one of the things we have here is, and Ben Cotter shared this on Facebook, proving that Facebook is not all evil. But it's a, it was a blog, Confessions of a Mormon Bishop. I appreciate you sharing this. I read it and really enjoyed it. He talked about some of the things that he learned. He talked about pornography, but one of the things he said was, I have learned that churches are not museums or catwalks for perfected saints, but rather labs for sinners. I think sometimes we come here and we look, we, we, we do leave our problems, but we, and, and we come here to church and we smile and we're kind, we're nice to each other, and everybody sees that and thinks, wow, that guy's got it all together. And I have so many problems. And I'm not as good as these people. Well, who wants us to feel like that? What does that do to us? That makes you feel like you're the only one in the world with these problems. And that doesn't connect us. But that isolates us. This is not a catwalk or a museum for perfected saints. This is a lab for sinners. Raise your hand if you've ever sinned. Okay. If your hand's not up, you just lie until you sin. So raise your hand. Hi. <laughs> we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of that when we're talking about pornography. To, to finish. He says, in our righteous desire to maintain an appropriate standard 
of complete avoidance of pornography, we should be careful not to use language that will only deepen shame and guilt of our loved ones who may be secretly addicted and drive them into deeper deception and darkness. We need to talk about this, but we need to talk about it in a loving and caring way, with open arms, the way our Savior would. Okay, no pointing fingers. We are all sinners. We all have our trials. We all have our temptations. And we need to be, be mindful of that. And this is one of those. We need to understand pornography better so that we can better talk about it and we can better help. Pornography is a drug. It's a visual drug. When you're viewing pornography, your brain actually releases chemicals. So you're not ingesting these chemicals through a needle or through some external source, but your brain produces them. It produces adrenaline and dopamine. And these chemicals bind us to the images that we see, the images that we're looking at. And it's a very real addiction, especially when, when we act out. Now, when I say act out, uh, I want to be sensitive to everybody in the room, but I'm talking about masturbation. Now, I will call it acting out, but that is what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what masturbation is, ask your parents. I'm not going to do everything. So you're going to have to have some conversations. But it will cause you to create, create it more and more. Now, studies show, this is interesting, and Dr. Hill talks about this in his book. Studies show that they've studied the brains of people who are addicted to pornography, which is a very real addiction to this visual brain drug. There is actually a physical change that happens in your brain, in the frontal cortex that controls impulse. It actually shrinks, it atrophies. And it reduces your ability, it cripples your ability to say no, to stop. That's, that's the part of your brain that says, ah, danger. And with time, it can shrink. It's called hyper, hyperfrontal syndrome, and it's prevalent in head traumas, in drug addiction, in sexual addiction, and addiction to food. And pornography is no different. Now the good news is, with time and distance, you can be healed. You can be healed physically, once you are healed spiritually. We're going to go through just a few things about addiction, and, and then we'll move on. Elder Holman calls this a contemporary, pernicious plague of pornography. In addition to distancing ourselves from this, there are steps that we need to take. And he recommends that the first step, whatever the steps you may need, to resolve this concern, come first to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about the importance of the gospel and the atonement, which is what we're here to celebrate today, Christ's resurrection and his atonement, in just a minute. Okay, addiction. As it applies to pornography, is a repetitive behavior which damages the person and others in his life, which the person is unable to stop. Addiction is a, is a pathological and a very powerful form of learning and memory. And pathology is, is described as a process of leaving a healthy or a normal state. What we know is good for us. With addiction, you leave that behind. This is the addictive, addictive cycle that people get stuck in. It starts with preoccupation, which is at the, at the top. Preoccupation is when you think about it. You think about these images. You remove yourself from your loved ones and you isolate yourself. Who wants us isolated? Save. Following preoccupation is ritualization, where you put yourself in a position to act out, the whole time telling yourself, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to view pornography. I'm not going to act out. But inevitably, acting out follows. And then you're left with only despair. This is the, the guilt and shame that you feel drives you into secrecy. <coughs> I'm actually sad that, see, that I don't see Steve Matthews, because we're going to talk about fishing. I figured he'd be excited. I'm not going to compare fishing to pornography, so you guys can relax. But who fishes? Anybody? Any fishermen? Raise your hand. Okay. What do you use? What do you use to, to catch a fish? Lure, bait. Lure, bait. But what hooks them? A hook. Ah. So, you use a hook. You, you use lures to bring them in. So what happens? The fish sees the lure, the fish sees the bait, and goes, hey, that looks good. That looks good. I like that. 
But what does he get? When he, when he takes the bait, when he bites at the lure, when he, what does he get? He gets hooked. At that point, his choices are very limited. He can struggle, and, and he'll struggle until he's tired, but he is under the control of the fishermen. And I'm not saying that the fishermen are the devil, <laughs> but they're all liars. <laughs> but the adversary, the adversary is a very skilled fisher. Only he's not fishing for for fish. He's fishing for people. The three hooks of pornography are guilt, pride, and shame. These hooks deeply rooted can allow the fisherman to pull the line and lead the fish wherever he wishes. The world is full of hooks, and it's full of lures. They call it intro fare. Scantily clad or sexually suggested images are everywhere. These are the lures of pornography. That is why we have to define this as anything that is designed to elicit a sexual interest in that person. While I was preparing my thoughts on this, I came home from work, and on our kitchen counter was a J.C. Penney's ad that came in the mail. Did anybody see this ad? There was a lady, dressed up like she was at something out of Moulin Rouge, like this, on a J.C. Penney's ad, and I apologize for anybody who... <laughs> anyway. There was an ad, it was on the camera. I picked it up, I showed it to my wife. I said, this is what I'm talking about. We've been talking about this. I said, this is intro fair. This is a lure. This is pornography. Came into our house through, through J.C. Penney's. When I was in high school, I used to subscribe to Sports Illustrated. Big sports fan. Love Sports Illustrated. It would come in the mail while I was at school. And my mom would take it out of the mail and go put it on my bed. Well, everybody knows that Sports Illustrated, once a year, had a swimsuit issue. I always knew when the swimsuit issue had arrived because it was the only issue all year long that was placed face down on my bed. My mom would see it and go, ah, but still take it back to my room. <laughs> but put it face down on my bed. She knew that what, what she was seeing was objectionable. But she didn't say anything. We didn't talk about it. There's a reluctance, and we all have it. Just like I described, a reluctance to talk to our children about these things. A, a reluctance to speak boldly, as the scripture suggests. And Satan uses that. Apathy and complacency are the devil's playground. Any space we give him, he will fill with darkness. And if we're not going to talk to our children about it, he's just going to keep shoving it down their throat. Let's talk about these hooks. Let's talk about pride. Who has number five? 